Um, Jericho is the Geography Education Research Collective, um, a small group of um, geography education researchers seeking to try and make a contribution um, to this broad field. Um, and we're so delighted to have James Essen, Angela Last, and Iram Samar with us on this massive important topic of anti-racist learning and teaching in school geography. And so our kind of big aim is to try and think through some of the ideas um, that James and Angela have made in their paper um, that we've kind of linked to, um, and then to try and work out and start this kind of discussion, continuous discussion about the ways in which some of these ideas might be worked out in the context of the school subject of geography. Um, so I'm going to do um, some brief introductions and then hand over um, to some presentations, first from James Angela, and then from Iran, and then some brief responses kind of between them, and then kind of opening the floor. And so this, uh, if as we go along, you've got questions and things that you wanna post in the chat, then please feel free to do that. And otherwise, um, hopefully we'll have plenty of time to um, open up the conversation further. Um, so just some kind of quick introductions um, is it in surname alphabetical order. And um, so to start with James, um, James made a really substantial contribution to these big questions about anti-racism and geography. Um, James is a reader in human geography at Loughborough University, where he also directs the Geography and Environment programme. He's on the editorial board of the journal Political Geography and has published extensively on migration, politics and mobility, urban dynamics and unconventional approaches to development, um, including a number of brilliant projects centred on a number of locations across Africa. And he's made some really key interventions in the discipline of geography, including through his area paper, The Why and the White, Racism and Curriculum Reform in British Geography, um, co-authored piece with Patricia Moxolo, Richard Baxter, Patricia Daly and Margaret Byron um, on the 2017 RGS IBG's chairs theme on decolonizing knowledges or reproducing coloniality um, and of course through this co-authored paper with Angela Last that's the subject of this afternoon's open forum anti-racist learning and teaching in British geography. Angela Last, um, the first thing I kind of point you to if you're not aware is Angela's blog, Mutable Matter. So it's mutablematter.wordpress.com. Um, it's just got such a brilliant set of reflections. Um, and I love how Angela describes her own experiences of writing, um, writing when you're confused, disturbed, or angry. Um, and this work kind of sits across um, and is inspired by these interdisciplinary fields, particularly the arts, humanities, and geographies, at times engaging with the space of geo humanities. Um, and just got a brilliant contribution to the edited collection on geopoetics in practice um, and a description of scrapping and rewriting a book project after realising it could be better. I think it's an incredibly brave action and piece of work. Um, yeah, just really fascinating to reflect on this space. Um, Angela is a uh, lecturer in human geography at Leicester and also holds honorary positions at Warwick and World Social Science Fellowship at the International Social Science Council. Um, Angela is a treasurer of the RGS IBG Race, Culture and Equality Working Group, an associate editor at Global Social Theory and a member of the editorial board Environment and Planning D. Um, Iram Samar, and we're so pleased that Iram's joining us um, this afternoon. In many ways, Iram's got um, kind of the most heavy intellectual lifting to do in terms of taking these ideas and thinking about the ways in which they might move context and be applied in the school subject of geography, kind of translating and rethinking these arguments, provocations and principles and concepts and um, to think how we might take the school subject forward. Um, Iram's backgrounds in geography and education and after gaining a secondary PhD in geography, Aram worked as a geography teacher, mainly in North and West London, across different faith and comprehensive schools, and then led to completing an MA in geography education with a focus on the intersectionality between global citizenship education, geography and Islam. And currently, um, Iran's a PhD student at UCL Institute of Education, where she'll be researching anti-racism and decoloniality within school geography in England, including contextualising anti-racism, um, including Islamophobia and decoloniality in school geography. So again, just so pleased that um, three of you are willing and able to give up your Saturday afternoons um, for this and to engage in this conversation. Um, really looking forward to seeing where we take this. Um, I'd say we're going to hand over first of all to James and Angela and then to Iram and then to responses between them and then to open the floor um, more broadly. So I said do um, feel free to use the um, chat and do keep yourselves on mute please. But first of all over to James and Angela. Thanks, Steve. And, and I wanted just another big thank you. I've said it before, but thank you again for the invitation um, to, to speak to Thanks. this open forum. Um, I'm really exciting, excited to write about this conversation. Um, and I, I have to admit, I agree that um, 
Here I am is doing the heavy lifting today. <laughs> so I'll start to, to share my, my screen um, and hopefully find the right presentation. Share. C can you see the, the slide okay, everyone? Yeah, fantastic. So for a little bit of context, Angela and I are going to speak for maybe 15 to 20 minutes. There are thereabouts when we practiced it last night. Um, and for sure, the aim is not to try and solve the issue of, of racism in, in learning and teaching within geography um, in the next 15, 20 minutes. If it was that easy, it would have been done before. But what we want to try and do is share some of the reflections from an article we wrote a few years ago. Um, and hopefully then we'll be able to think through how those reflections might be of relevance to school geography. First of all, some acknowledgement. Um, and these are just some examples of who we've been drawing on and being in conversation with. First of all, the race, culture, and equality working group that we are uh, both part of. Um, that sparked the building the anti racist classroom and um, decolonizing geography. But there are some lots of other groups that we keep on coming across and then never know entirely how uh, they're connected. For example, there's the Black Curriculum, there's Consented. So it would be great if people are and the audience who are also um, connected to these um, initiatives uh, to uh, talk to us about them. So in the paper, basically, we have we followed two broad themes. One is the experiences of um, of yeah um, of racism in spaces uh, the spaces of uh, education, and the other one is how racism affects geography as a discipline, so how it distort, distorts the knowledge. Um, there are three themes that we, how we kind of summarize things, but sort of bring in our own reflection as well, which we're going to go through in a minute, um, which we've called um, to recognize our humanity, um, experimenting uh, with our or your history, um, and say the unsavable. So we're talking about these three themes. Yeah, and, and the, the reason, well, one of our aims from this session is that we're going to help those in the audience and also ourselves through the reflections, think of ways how we can incorporate explicitly anti-racist praxis into our learning and teaching. And I, and I think that's a really important point where I think we're trying to move the conversation from being neutral um, about issues of race and racism to being explicitly anti-racist. So I think that's one of the key messages that we try to put through in our paper and hopefully will come through in the talk today. We haven't got time to go through this in great detail, but it would be remiss of me to present this paper as if you know, we're the first one to think about anti-racism in, in, in school geography or British geography, or that these debates haven't been going on for a very long time. So I just wanted to point you to some existing resources because I'm very conscious that sometimes we, we end up almost reinventing the wheel and duplicating effort. And there are actually some really rich resources um, available to us that have been around for quite some time. And, and Joan Norcup did a fantastic job of digitally archiving for example, contemporary issues in geography and education, and that was edited and led by the, the late um, um, Jill, Jill, um, 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 Jill Dorn. And um, I, I just, yeah, I guess my, my concern is just that we, we sometimes reinvent the, sorry, Dawn, Dawn, Dawn Gill, sorry, we re reinvent the wheel. Um, sometimes I just wanted to point to some of these resources and, and also to highlight that. Some of the debates we're seeing in the, in the political forum around um, structural racism, these are not new debates, you know? So if we think back to the 1980s, for example, there's a very controversial report that was written about West Indian children in our schools. I can't go into the details of the, the debates right now, but one of the key messages here was around how our education system does lead to racist outcomes um, and that we need to realize that that's the case. And the reason I flagged that is that this report was controversial for saying that explicitly. And we're seeing those narratives play out again. Into, so I guess my point is that there's nothing new under the sun in, in many ways. Um, and, and also just to point to, for example, the work of Peter Jackson, um, who looked at challenging racism through geography teaching and as of others, but just to point that we're not the first to do so. And just to apologize, it's, it's Dawn Gill. Um, it's, yeah, it's been a, it's a long morning. Um, multiple school clubs already this morning with my children. And so apologies, that it's, it's the late Dawn Gill. And also just wanted to point to some current resources in the contemporary period. So. Um, Remy Joseph Salisbury's got some stuff on race and racism in English secondary schools, talking about challenges around racial literacy, how we need to reform our curriculum. So just again, to point colleagues to some potential resources there that might be of use. Angela. Um, 
so just to um, basically emphasize that the the work that we've been doing is not sort of disconnected from a lot of um, you know really very very contributions from other geographers. Uh, also, people in other disciplines that feed into geography have been um, raised a lot of uh, have been raising a lot of points on uh, around racism, uh, um, but also um, the kind of practices that, that are possible um, that that we can do also from different um, you know everyone represents differently in a classroom and how you can um, how you can uh, experiment with with these. Um, with, with sort of different sorts of ideas. And then the, the final thing I'll say before we kind of move on to the main content, content of the presentation is that many of us don't realize that actually issues of race and racism in our classrooms are actually safeguarding issues. You know, we're actually exposing our children to harm, children to harm in, in the classroom through race and racism. And I don't mean this just in terms of people saying inappropriate things, but the content that we're teaching them and showing them perhaps through our textbooks. And we don't have to think about it as a safeguarding issue, but for me, it very much is one. And we also need to realize that every child has the right not to be discriminated against on the grounds of their race, ethnicity, religion, their gender. So again, where this is also a rights issue as well. So I think that sometimes we lose, sometimes we lose sight of that, that, bigger, that bigger kind of context. Um, so I just wanted to, to put that into this space for us to also think through. Okay, so now to get to the talk proper. One of the reasons why anti-racist work, especially in education is so hard is that we see how all these different scales come together and almost collapse themselves within the classroom space. You've got the individual, you've got person's beliefs and actions um, that might be leading to um, oppression. You've got interpersonal interactions between people. You've got the institutional context that could be reproducing racism. And then we've got the wider structural context. And I think one of the reasons why anti-racist work, not just in geography, but education is so difficult, is as I said, within the space of the classroom, all these different domains just come in and collapse on each other. And they can happen in an instant, in a moment. A, a child makes a comment or you see something in a, a textbook that's inappropriate and it brings them all together in, into that space. And I'm gonna talk at the end about why actually that also is a reason why anti-racist work can be so powerful, that we have the opportunity to make a real big, big difference in our classrooms. And before I move on to the, the next slide, I just want to flag that this lens of systemic oppression is very similar to the work by Patricia Hill Collins, a black feminist um, scholar and her matrix of domination. But we don't need to go into that detail now, but I just think it's important to acknowledge the work of black feminist scholars, especially as I think it strongly influenced this, this lens of systemic oppression. So let's start with the first guiding principle that we want to try and leave you with. And as I said, we've only got 20 minutes or so, so we can't change the face of drug education that time. But what we want to do is leave you with a few kind of key ideas that hopefully you'll take away. And when you step into the classroom, they'll be in, in, in your mind. And the first one is to recognize each other's humanity. And, and often I get asked, James, what could I do differently to you know, change my classroom practice and to adopt an anti-racist position? I say to people, recognize your students' humanity see them as full human beings. And people often say to me, ah, yeah, but give me something more, more concrete, something more tangible. And, and that misses the fundamental point. Unless you recognize this principle, everything else is probably gonna be a waste of time. If you're not seeing your children in your classroom as, as full, full human beings, we're gonna be reproducing racism. And, I, and a simple way to think about this is that racism is fundamentally about dehumanization. It's about placing people in the hierarchy of superiority, superiority and inferiority and originally, let's just be very blunt, blunt here. Some people were seen as being less than human. They were not recognized as human beings. That is what we're dealing with. So if we don't acknowledge that part of being anti-racist is to recognize each other's humanity, we're always gonna be starting on the back foot, yeah? But I do appreciate that that's quite an abstract thing to say, you know, let's recognize each other's humanity. So let's think about this in a slightly more kind of tangible way. I'm a child of the eighties. Um, so I grew up in school, when I went to school, this was a very, very, um, popular song do they know it's Christmas um, now the reason why I flag this is this song was designed to actually try and help people in, in so-called um, third world context especially in African context facing poverty but ask yourself is that an appropriate representation of African people to be circulating in the public domain or in any domain so as a child growing up in school, I had people singing, asking me, do I know it's Christmas from where I'm from, James? Do, you know, do they know it's Christmas? And again, my point is actually, if we think about our teaching and some of our resources, 
we're reproducing very, very similar tropes and narratives about parts of the world um, that, in my opinion, dehumanize, because I don't think it's appropriate for a child to be, or any human being to be placed in a public forum with that type of imagery and allow that to circulate. And we sometimes see in our existing geography textbooks, highly problematic representations of, of places and people that I would argue dehumanizes them and robs them of their dignity. And let's think through the lyrics of, of, of this song, Do They Know It's Christmas? And I'll, I'll read some of them out now. And the Christmas bells that ring, there are the chain, clanging chimes of doom. Well, tonight, thank God, it's them instead of you. So othering, yeah? And there won't be snow in Africa this Christmas time. The greatest gift they'll get this year is life. Where nothing ever grows, no rain or rivers flow. Do they know it's Christmas time as well? Now, I'm using this as quite a, I would say slightly actually a cheeky example, but my, my point here is one that the, the narratives, the tropes, the stereotypes, the misconceptions, the lack of geographical accuracy, no rain, no rivers flowing, like it's, it's highly problematic. But again, if you think about some of the resources that we use in our classrooms, they reproduce these very similar tropes and narratives about African context, for example. So next time you go into a classroom and you're gonna teach a topic, especially about the global South, um, ask yourself, do they know it's Christmas? Literally ask yourself that. When you look at your textbooks and your resources, ask yourself, do they know it's Christmas? You know, ask yourself, am I telling the children in my room, do they know it's Christmas? And, and as silly as it sounds, for me, it's made a powerful difference in my own teaching at a university level. I, I look at textbooks in a very, very different way and ask myself these fundamental questions because, as I said, without realizing it, these are the subtle ways in our everyday teaching that we dehumanize people um, and rob them of their dignity. And a key part of anti-racist um, learning and teaching, I would argue, is to, to recognize each other's humanity and to rehumanize people when they're being dehumanized. Angela, over to you. So this kind of follows on from the theme of um, huge inaccuracies and also um, uh, how it connects um, you know, to the perception of students, but also to the perception of, of the field. Um, so I had to do a lot of research into geography because I didn't do geography as an undergrad. I did at A level, got really disillusioned, and then came in the sort of the back rows. <laughs> um, and and to me, what sort of seemed to have happened in geography is so first of all, you said, um, or the geography teacher said, oh, this is what people did, and it was supposedly factual knowledge. Then there was this critical geography that said, oh, this is what people did, and it was bad and we've given certain practices like slash and burn and other um you know example people um we, we've um you know been really colonial in our attitude and such and such like my kin and people have done really bad things but what it doesn't do is it doesn't show you the counter geographies but and, and also it eliminates um connections between things um um, so what we've been trying to do as one experiment, especially um, as I mentioned, we represent differently in the classroom. So as a white person, I, I represent differently than uh, James. And uh, I'm uh, we also raised that um, with Iram in, in the talk last week when we had a bit of a um, sort of prep talk <laughs> about how you represent in the in the classroom and also how you can't know about every country like the person that is from the country and it, from a particular group within that country and so on. So what do we do as geography teachers and, and um, at school and geography level? And I think everyone is experimenting with this, but there's some quite useful things that you can do in it. There's some things like, um, it, one of the ones also get raised by physical geographers a lot is naming places. Um, looking at the the original names, but also to the history of a how a place was named, um, and so recognizing and problematizing that. Um, also, what's really important to me, and I do teach a lot of historical geography at the moment, is to show the global interconnectedness, and that has always been. I think even if part of the parts of the world were not necessarily connected. Um, in the same ways all the time. But even if you just look at things like Marco Polo on, on TV, then you can see how people were connected in the Middle Ages. And here's, let's put an example of the Tapia Rogeriana, or however it's pronounced in the English Latin version. Um, you know, 
uh, by Aldrisi. So um, there, there, you know, that was a, a, a map by a Muslim scholar commissioned by a Norman king, and uh, you have uh, lots of examples of that. And in the last uh, um, session that I did, I held up a banknote and said, "Look, you know, where does this come from?" And uh, you know, it relates to then yeah, China and the um, colonial um, necessities of not being able to carry lots of like uh, heavy metals around, <laughs> metals around and just having like uh, this innovation from China as a replacement and then starting the money system. And there's so many other things that go into it. So it's really it's sort of looking at how did, what is Europe actually, what is, how we are, con are we connected? How was the world connected? at different times, like the Silk Road and everything, it, it, it's really important um, things to raise. And it's difficult to bring everything into whatever space you have, which is never enough, but it's you can do bits and pieces, I think. Yeah, and I guess just to kind of follow up on Angela's point there is that what we're trying to encourage students in the classroom to realize is that often we teach history about here and there. And actually try to say actually history is far more interconnected than that so that's why we've got to experiment with your history and connecting that to our history so a really simple example here is you've got kenya uganda congo rwanda burundi tanzania and late victoria bang in the middle to understand that history of, of africa in that context you have to understand the history of the united kingdom and to kind of re remove that kind of othering that we sometimes do with the way we teach history and, and geography and again to Angela's kind of point that it can also be useful just to think about some of the everyday geographical um, tools that we think about, like maps, you know, and, and think of, and I know it's a very obvious, obvious trope, but there's a history to map making or politics to map making, but we still sometimes focus very much on, you know, the Peters projection or, or you know, the Makata projection. But as I just said, there's deeper connections, for example, through Islamic geography, you know, and map making through is Islamic context. And I think my sense is from speaking to some of my students that, it's very rare for our, our Muslim students to feel that Islam had a geography, like contributed to geography. And it can be very empowering, empowering for students while also being um, <laughs> an example of scientific rigor, showing students to go a little bit deeper. So yeah, th thanks Andrew, just to follow up on, on that point. And then the last one is probably the most contentious and I think it kind of ties the, the, other, the other three, other two points together. And, that's the realization that an anti-racist approach to learning and teaching is not just about when we teach children and, and also adults, I guess we could say, or when we teach about race and racism. It's about the ways in which our curriculum in a range of ways, so in a range of different topics, may have areas where we might see issues of racism or areas where we can see opportunities to present an anti-racist message. However, in order to do that, we often have to say and talk about things that are going to make us either incredibly uncomfortable or that we might feel make our students uncomfortable, make our par the parents uncomfortable, um, other members of our school uncomfortable. And, and that's a really difficult thing to do. However, we don't really have much choice because the alternative is to say nothing. And by saying nothing, we then will become complicit. And as I said before, we almost treat issues of race and racism as something we can be neutral about. And in order to explain how society organizes itself along racial lines, we are going to have to use words, for example, like um, white privilege, terms like white privilege, terms like white supremacy, terms like colonialism, terms like empire, terms like decolonizing. And as, when, as we were very aware that these are very contested terms, but also very much aware that these are terms that are incredibly complex and difficult. And often we have a lot of competing pressures in the classroom already. So I guess what we're trying to say now is that um, What we don't want to give an impression here that we're completely devoid of the context that teachers are working and saying, you need to add this, you need to add this, you need to add that. What we're trying to say is think about things you're already doing and how you can incorporate some of these key messages in them, how you can say the unsayable within practice that you're already doing in the everyday, in, in the everyday classroom. And it's not, about name, it's not about shaming students. It's not about saying to someone, you've done this wrong, you've done that wrong. Um, that's not what we're trying to suggest here. Um, but we are very much trying to say that I gave the example around talking about development geography. There are opportunities there when you talk about development geography, for example, to explain why the world is the way that it is, and also add some context there in terms of, as I said, things like colonialism, um, 
And again, that might lead to issues, conversations around whiteness and, you know, and the role that white supremacy played in the colonial, colonial process. That is a very uncomfortable thing to have to talk about in a classroom. But in order to engage in anti-racist work, we do have to say things that are often seen as unsayable in our society. Um, and I think Iram's got a few examples of how you can think that through in practice. Um, and again, I know that we're talking about some quite abstract ideas, but we're trying to do them in as concise a way and kind of a headline way as possible to hopefully leave you with a few key points that you can kind of kind of take from the conversation. And the final thing I'll say on this point is that as part of those conversations, it's very likely that tensions will emerge within the classroom context. And I'm thinking here, for example, of recent debates around the white working class. Um, so for example, if you are to talk about issues of race and racism impacting racialized minority groups, some people might feel, well, actually, what about the white working class? And I've got kind of two responses there. The white working class are a racial group. <laughs> so that, that, that's one thing to think about. But secondly, working class is not an affiliation that only applies to white people <laughs> or people racialized as white. So again, I think these are actual opportunities to think about solidarity building as well between and across, across groups um, when we have these type of conversations. Um, so, so I, I want to wrap up here because I think we've gone a little bit over time and just end that in the same reason why anti-racism work is incredibly difficult to do, you've got the, inter, you've got the um, interpersonal, the intersubjective, the institution, you've got the structural. That's also why it can be so powerful in the classroom, how we really can make a difference with anti-racist practice in classroom spaces, precisely because we bring together all these different, different domains, often within a classroom setting. And I think that for me, that gives us lots of room for hope and an opportunity to make a real change within society, not just in geography, but society more broadly, because I, I, I often used to, parents used to come to open days and say, you know, if my child does geography, what can they become? And at the time, Theresa May was prime minister. So I used to say, well, you could actually end up running the country. And I know that's a bit facetious and cheeky, but my point is that geographers have a real impact in the world in, in lots of ways. And I think that without realizing when we teach our students, both for undergraduate and, and you know, in, in school geography, we have a massive impact on how they see the world and how they interact with the world. And I think that graces, gives us a great opportunity to do some really good anti-racist work. Um, Iram, I'm now gonna come to you if that's okay. Um, and I know that you're gonna try and make some of the stuff we just talked about more tangible for, for school geography. So I'll stop sharing my screen now and, and come to you. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. Hi, um, yes. Let me just, I don't actually have a PowerPoint to share with you, but um, I, 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 I'm just gonna sort of basically try and um, see if I can see my screen, which I can't. Okay, so, uh, peace and greetings everyone. Um, I just want to say first of all um, thank you for inviting me to this panel and, and Dr James and Dr Angela thank you so much for this paper that you've written. As a school geography teacher let me just say that it was like a lifesaver for me uh, as too was your paper um, Steve and also um, uh, with, um, uh, with uh, was it uh, I think the, the, the paper with um, uh, Steve Puttock and um, Amber, Amber, Murray, Amber yeah. Yeah. yeah, and um, you know these two papers like really sort of made me realize where I am with my teaching, and um, basically um, I I'll just mention I've worked in a few London schools, so I've worked in um, predominantly white schools and also like multi ethnic, multicultural schools and also mono um, faith schools as well. Um, I want to mention that because I think we're obviously talking about race and racism here. So it's really important that we bring in ethnicity into this discussion as well now. Um, and just to show you um, what it actually looks like um, in the classroom as a, as a, like for a geography teacher. Now, obviously for me, um, I, you know, um, I'm a geography teacher and when you vis physically look at me, uh, you can see that I'm brown, I've got a hijab on. So there's instantly some questions that students 
want to ask me okay so it's some the race and racism for me is something that I can't shy away from it's something that I am forced to do in my very first meeting with my first geography class so I'm going to try to uh, like focus in on your three aims and um, you know recognizing each other's humanity save the unstable experiment with your history I'm going to show you how it kind of happens in the classroom um, so you know what I understand from your paper is that you're you know you're kind of pushing towards um, encouraging people to have this anti-racist approach uh, when you're teaching a subject like geography because it's so important because we are talking about the world here and we're talking about people within the world we're talking about different societies different civilizations and to bring that together and to sort of achieve this equitable and just uh, sort of um, uh, what's the word uh, idea into the classroom is a very important um, idea to come away with and hopefully when when we finished our discussion it will encourage teachers that were a bit un, unsure when they like tuned in today about how they can actually implement it so uh, hopefully by the end of today you will on Monday ha ha be a little bit more clear and and have the do it now kind of attitude and think yeah you know what I can actually implement this today um, in my lesson. So how do we get the anti-racism um, idea implemented into the geography classroom? Well, I, I want to talk about, first of all, my um, interactions with uh, the, the various different schools. And I want to start off by um, being the other. OK, so um, I want you to picture this. I go into a classroom. It, it's the first time I've gone into a class with an all white um, sort of um, British white sort of class. And I think to myself, um, this is, the, you know, I love geography. I'm going to make them love ge geography too. And then all of a sudden I'm on, on my own and then students start firing questions and they start commenting on, uh, Miss, uh, oh, uh, what's that on your head? Uh, oh, Miss, uh, are you a terrorist? Oh, Miss, um, your name's Os uh, Sama, is it? Oh, Sama, are you related to Osama? And then I'm like, whoa, what do I do with this? So I'm going to tell you what I do with it. I flip the script. What I do is I just get my whiteboard, I get my pen, and I go, okay, who am I? So I literally get their ideas together on the board. And I go, okay, guys, so you've noticed that I'm different. What did you, where, where do you think I'm from? And then they're like firing, oh, miss, I think you're from India. Oh, miss, I think you're from Bangladesh. Oh, miss, I think you're from Pakistan. And then I write all of this down, because that's my first geography lesson. And I think this is great. I could, I could think to myself, oh, my gosh. What do I do? This is this is racism. Call SLT. Do do something about it. Do a do a call out. But then I think to myself, you know what? I've got the power now to educate the students. I've got the power to to make them understand what anti-racism is. And it's not a case of me just saying, "Hello, guys. This is the word anti-racism, and this is how you do it." No, it doesn't work like that. Sometimes you don't even use these words. Sometimes you don't even use the word racist. Sometimes you don't even use the word anti-racist. You just be anti-racist. Or when someone's being racist to you, you're not gonna say to them, you're being racist. They're just being racist to you. So how do we deal with this? So I'm gonna give you a really interesting example. So I'm, I'm gonna pick up on your point, James, about the development, how do we teach development? So I had these boys and they were like very, very um, vocal in how they felt about me. I mean, I even had the comment, Miss, go back home. And I was like, okay, we, we need to decide where my home is. <laughs> when you tell me where my home is, when we figure it out, then we'll, we'll, then we'll have that discussion. So then we had this discussion we to and fro, and then, I, and then at the end of it, I wish I could share my slide, but I, I don't know how to do it technically at the moment, but I had this huge, a mind map of my own identity. I had like all the countries written. I had even Osama bin Laden's name. I had Saudi Arabia, I had UK. And then I told them where I was born, Oldham, moved to Oxford, then moved to London, graduated in London. I gave them my whole life story and it was quite risky, but I had to do it because I wanted to change their attitudes. I wanted them to accept me. And it comes back to your idea about the uh, feeling human, and uh, like this idea of not accepting being de dehumanized. So I um, kind of um, showed them that, look, I had a life in Britain, just like you, but it's new to you. 
Um, so just fast forwarding on, um, I'm teaching them development. And I think to myself, these guys need to know about colonialism, right? They keep telling me to go back home. And it comes back to uh, the famous quote, but quote by Sivan when he says, I'm over here because you were over there. So, you know, when you use these kind of quotes, you're not necessarily showing them the academic side of it, but you're kind of showing them what that means in the lesson. So here I am trying to teach about colonialism, but then I remember, hang on a minute, I'm South Asian. I watch Bollywood movies, well, I used to back in the day. And I remember one movie that I watched called Lagan, and it was a really interesting movie. And in that movie, they show the British Raj in, in action, basically. So um, it's like a about a five minute clip. So I just quickly look for it on YouTube and I put it on for them. And it's a bunch of um, uh, uh, like farmers who are like literally playing cricket um, for their um, land. So there's this um, uh, colonel who's from the British Empire, and uh, then all these um, uh, cricketers who are trying to play for their land. And I look to the students, right? And they're like, it's, they're like totally engaged. Like, what is going on? There's music, there's dance, there's all sorts of things. And they're like, what is this? This is brilliant. And then by the end of it, I, I, as I turn the video off, they're like, Miss, role play. Can we do role play? And I said, no, but let me explain. Miss, you don't need to explain. We understand, we get it. And, and they're on the table, they've got their jumpers wrapped around their heads and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what do I do now? And SLT slowly come into the room, look what's, they look at what's going on and then they slowly walk back out because it was like mayhem what was happening. They, they just took over and they just really wanted to be the cricketers and they wanted to just do it. So they wrote their little scripts and they enacted this, this scene and none of them wanted to be the Colonel, <laughs> the British Raj Colonel and they were like, I was like, who's going to be the, this, this guy? And they were like, Miss you, you're going to be him. And I'm like, no, 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 I don't want to be him. They're like, yeah. So here I am uh, pretending I put a fake moustache on and they're, and they're like enacting, they're fighting for their land and they're like empathizing. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is not the impact I wanted, but this is the impact I'm getting by just physically decolonizing, by showing them, not by explaining, but showing them what it looks like. And even though it was like, like a Bollywood movie, but it was it was so important to bring that into the into context because it brought out so much geography. And do you know, forgive me if I cry, but what got me was when I was on duty <laughs> the following like like lunchtime, and they were talking about it on the playground. Oh, you know what we did in our lesson? We learned about this, and then you know, you know, you know that anti-racism has happened. Does does that make sense? So that's just a little example of how you can really bring a geography lesson alive and talk about race and racism without actually saying those two words. Um, and um, another example I want to, the reason why I'm giving you examples is because it's very difficult as a school teacher to, to grab a paper and sort of read, you know, some excellent theoretical um, research that someone's done and it's quite hard to engage because when you have a 16 year old or a 12 year old in front of you asking you strange questions about race and racism those papers somehow don't work anymore so you've got to have that little link so hopefully I'll be creating that little link for you that how do we how do we bring the theory into practice so um, another example is um, I was assigned to a um, Sikh school in um, London and um, you'd think I know everything about South Asians right but here I was in a school um, and students were saying to me um, they, they, they were like um, uh, telling me about their religion they were they were like uh, talking to me about my religion and then I realized this is the same kind of conversation I've had in that previous school that I was just talking about and then I got to know the students they got to know me I helped them through their GCSEs and it was like, it was amazing because we had our discussions as well. We had our cultural discussions. We talked about our uh, differences. We talked about our similarities and it was the same kind of flow. Um, and this is where I wanna bring cultural, uh, culturally responsive pedagogy into this. Now, it seems like a very, um, like a buzz kind of a way of teaching, but on the ground, it's the most easiest way of teaching. 
So when we say culturally responsive pedagogy, what we're talking about is we're talking about responding to the child or the person's culture um, and engaging with the culture, not necessarily adopting the culture or you know, uh, doing anything special with the culture, but just knowing that they might come with a different culture, they might come with a different mindset, they might come with a different worldview and to respect that worldview and to allow them to tell you their worldview and, and to allow them to talk about their culture. And um, it, in this example, um, I just wanted to share with you that the, the situation was reversed. Now I'm learning, I'm not teaching anymore, okay? So uh, the same thing happened when I went to a, a, a like a Hindu faith school as well. And there was, a, there was a list of things that I could and could not do in terms of should or should not do more like, like out of respect. So obviously because they are vegetarian, um, they requested that people don't bring meat into the school. So I remember just going, all right, in the car, not gonna take that in school. And just having that respect in my heart that I'm going into a new space and I'm going to have to, you know, um, change myself a little bit to sort of um, be respectful, so to speak. Um, and I've also worked in a Muslim school as well. And it's quite interesting. Interesting That experience was interesting as well, because I remember reciting something in Arabic and a girl from Algeria corrected me and said, Miss, um, your Arabic's really poor. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, I've been saying it like that all my life. And she's like correcting me. She's like a year seven student. So as you can see, um, you know, when you engage with your students in geography, you could really um, turn their personal geographies into the lesson and you need to learn to contextualize it and not be so rigid in the classroom. And if you do, if you do adopt an anti-racist approaches to teaching, what you'll find is that you'll have a better time. You'll, you'll actually enjoy yourself a bit more as well. So it's not something that is like daunting or scary to do. Um, just, just to wrap up, because um, my stories can go on and on. Um, so I just want to come back to, I think I've hit three points. Um, the, the recognizing humanity, the saying the unsayable with all those, um, you know, those racist comments, you turning them on their head and making it into the geography and also exploring your own history. So talking about, you know, sharing with them that yes, I'm from Pakistan. Once Pakistan was um, connected to India and, um, you know, it was the British colonialism that split the two countries. You know, there's so much dialogue you can have with your own histories when you bring them into the classroom. And then the best thing is when you get them to do it, when they give you their histories and, and you then you, you're at home marking papers, sorry, marking books. You're actually enjoying the read because you're like, oh, I didn't know this about this student. And then you then you use that and bring it into the lesson, next lesson. But that's another lecture. OK, I just to wrap up then. Um, so. Basically, the two key things, identity and colonialism. When we look at these two things, what we are potentially doing is we're opening the fountain of anti-racism, right? We're actually allowing students to feel free with their geographies and we're allowing them to access the true geography. And you're absolutely right, uh, Dr. James, when you said um, this idea about, um, you know, having, um, everyone having their own geographies. And yes, Islamic geography for me is the reason why I got into geography in the first place. I was so interested in how everyone perceived the world that I just wanted to learn more and more. And then when I did my undergraduate study, I'm so glad I had some great teachers that I was able to explore that further. And I was thinking, you know what? I need to, I need to get into the classroom. I want to go back into the classroom and, and change this now. So here I am now, just talking away. <laughs> so thank you so much for listening to me. I think I've gone over my time a little bit. So Awesome. Thank you. Just nice. to, shall I just conclude? Um, something um, interesting, Pat Noxolo tweeted this morning uh, about Tony Morrison on white supremacy. Uh, I don't want to dwell on it too long, but she talked, some, she talked about, uh, uh, there's a quote here and I'll just, read the quote to you if I can get it up. Um, 
sorry. Let me just read it off to you. Anyway, she, it was something along the lines of um, equity that if you're on one knee, so if you if you're standing on, I don't know why my computer is not working. I wanted to quote it properly, but if you are standing on your sorry, if you are on your knees and you feel that you are equal to that person, then you need to reconsider what you're doing because when you're when when someone's on their knee at your level then what, what level would they be if they stood up in front of you? So I think with, when we talk about race, sometimes when we talk about um, people overusing their like white privilege, what we're, what we're actually saying is that we've like people of color, global majority, ethnic minorities, call us what you will, have so, for so long been on our knees. And it's time that we kind of stood up together as who we are and to be recognized as well. And, you know, in our school systems, we need to recognize some of our teachers that are really, really underrated and not, you know, not promoted as well. And they have such wealth of knowledge, but, you know, the system just somehow seems to, you know, favor a certain type of race. And then when we talk about not talking about race and racism, it hurts. And I think that's important as well, but, but, but let's stay positive because, you know, all this, uh, research is going on now so let's hope that there's a brighter future a more equitable future thanks thank you awesome no thank you so much thank you and um, i think i'm gonna um hand back over to um james angela for any kind of initial brief responses that you'd like to make am i yeah i'm not on mute no the first thing i want to say is um I was really touched when Iram got in touch because naively, when we, Andrew and I, we, we wrote that paper, we didn't actually realise that it would actually be read by school teachers. <laughs> well, I didn't anyway. Um, I'm quite naive in the sense that I, don't, I write something, I'm not always sure where it's going to end up. And when Iram said it really touched her and that she could see lots of benefits in what we were saying, it made me realise that we do need to do a bit more in terms of engaging with school teachers. So I'm trying to do a lot more work in that space. Um, and also to make some of the ideas, as Aaron said, that are quite theoretical, slightly more maybe tangible and more practical for, for everyday teaching. Um, so, so Aaron, I wonder if I can maybe just respond to a few comments, few points that you made in, in your, your talk. And one thing that really struck me was your ability to make a connection with your students. And I think that's something that whether you're in higher education or in, second, in school geography, that's actually a really powerful thing to be able to do. I was wondering if you could maybe talk to a little bit more how you, you build that connection and also use that as a way to counteract racism. And I'm using counteract, not challenging. So I think challenging racism is, is one way to do something, but it's actually quite a passive way because you're saying someone's done something wrong, you challenge it, but it doesn't necessarily change things fundamentally. So I think what you're very good at, you're good at doing Aram, is counteracting racism. So you simultaneously acknowledge it and find ways to, to move the, the conversation and people's behavior on. So I'm just wondering how you, you build that connection. I think, I think for me, being um, subjected to such racism, made me so fed up and hurt that I just wanted, I just didn't want the next generation to, to go through that anymore. So I thought to myself, you know, when I, when I get in, when I get into the classroom, if I do, I'm sort of ready for the racist remarks. So when I say ready for racist remarks, what I'm saying is that I, oh, I already have these feelings in my heart that someone might say something and I'd be, I'm prepared for it that there could be racism, there could be an issue that oh, I have to discuss race. And just to um, just sh share with you, um, this is just a book. I don't, I don't wanna like um, embarrass any uh, authors or <laughs> books or anything, but if you just have a look at this picture, okay, this is Somalia depicted in a book, right? So a little boy collecting wood and you've got like people queuing up for food and just corruption and destruction basically and basically I'll show you how I actually implemented uh, the you know culturally responsive pedagogy there was a smiling girl and she goes to me miss um I love these books let me have a look and she flicks through and she she goes oh wow you know we've got a smiling case study let me have a look and then her face drops and I'm like teaching and my face drops because I'm feeling what she's feeling. And she goes, and she's like looking at other, other pages and she goes, Miss, this ain't my Somali, this ain't my Somali land. And she shuts the book and puts it down. And 
you know, I'm quite an emotional person and I kind of, I, I kind of teared up. And I just remember that day very clearly. And I remember like really tearing up and, and she goes, and then she kind of came up to me and she goes, Mr, are you okay? And I, and I was like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? But I, I want to share that with you because it really hit me that it hurts our children when they see their country represented in some of these books. They, they love geography. They want, they want to study geography. But when they see their place of um, heritage represented, they get really disappointed. And then, then what I have to do as a teacher is I have to bring them back in, right? So then we start crit critiquing the book. <laughs> so I say, okay, what would you like to see in the pit? What would you like to see in this double page spread? And that becomes one of my activities. And it's actually quite a powerful one. So you can ask the students, okay, you've got a week now, go away and rewrite the script bring some pictures. And there was one particular boy, I have to share this with you. He said he played beach, um, he played football on the beach in Somalia with all his like cousins and the, the different people that lived around his area. And um, he put that in, in, in his little um, sort of uh, uh, script. And it was so beautiful to see the different, the range of um, ideas that they came up with when they're allowed to talk about their own geographies. And, and I think we've got to learn from this. I know it's very small scale, we're talking GCSE here or A-level, but imagine if we did that as academics where we gave uh, the authority to the indigenous to, to write about your place or write about your place of abode. Like when we talk about slums, uh, we, we quite openly say the word slum, we just use it like it's just, just use it. And then, then there's a TED talk about this, this uh, young man and he's from Drawi and he says, my place is, this, this is my home that you're talking about. This is, this is where my family lives. This is where, you know, this is where my auntie is. This is where my uncle is. This is where my community is. And you just called it a slum. It might look like a slum to you, but then he talks about all the commerce that's going on. Um, not in big fancy buildings, but you know, they're recycling, they're doing all these great things. And he shares that with us. And, and to show this to the students is really, really powerful. Because then they realize, hang on a minute, what am I doing? Am I, I'm, I'm, I'm so judgmental. And, and I think, unfortunately, in some of our textbooks, no disrespect to the authors, because I know they do immense hard work trying to get this, you know, right. But if we don't, if we don't get um, Black or Asian authors involved in textbook writing, then what's going to happen is that this is going to happen. It's going to reproduce itself again and again, and it's not going to stop. So teachers have a huge job to, to change that, but they need the support. They need the support higher up the hierarchy. So hopefully that's something that maybe scholars who are listening can, can, can sort of um, respond to our plea that we need you and you guys need us too. And you need to work together, you know, like the, late Cedric Robinson and, you know, Siva and all of these people that had these excellent, um, you know, writings to learn from, where they connected the, the, you know, the academic world with the working class world and they came together as community. I think we need to do something like that. And this forum, thank you so much for letting me be a part of it. Thank you. Sorry, um, thanks, Iran. Really good, good answer, Steve. Can I ask one more question? Is that sure. okay, just Iran? Um, so the first thing I'll just flag is that so when we're just talking about how um, places are represented in textbooks, again, and Dawn Gill in the in the journal that she put together in the nineteen eighties and edited, I think the first issue talks about this issue of representations of places in textbooks, and it has a really good analysis of how we can kind of counteract this. So again, I just want to reiterate that we've got resources in place that have been around for decades, and we need to maybe make use of them before we recreate new ones. But my question, Iran, was going to be around um, kind of saying the unsable in these kind of uncomfortable conversations. And I'm just wondering, cause I think we've all been in kind of situations where it could be our, our child says something, um, and I know school teachers go through it quite a lot, but I'm also very aware that teachers have a curriculum to get through. You've got stuff you've got to get, you've got all kinds of things going on. How do you kind of carve out the time in your lessons to sometimes have these uncomfortable conversations? And very, I'm just asking in a very practical sense, because I know teachers on the call, you've got, as I said, lesson plans, everything going on. You've got things pretty much down to the minute. A student says or does something, or you see something in a text. 
how do you how do you kind of respond and have that kind of you say the unsayable in that in that moment if does that make sense Iram that yes it does make sense it makes absolute sense because it happens to to you like if you're a, like a good geography teacher who really wants the students to have the essence of geography you will you will have a planned lesson and you will change it for for that student you'll change it so you'll change what you wanted to teach you I call them expresso lessons right where you just kind of think of something uh, you've got a lesson plan but you think of something on the spot to to help that student make sense um like for example I, I'm not sure if this is like is an example but just another uh, picture in a textbook of this gentleman here um and he's uh, obviously a British white um student and they kind of give like loads of global connections which is a really nice activity similar to one I talked about earlier. Um, and obviously what I would do is I'd, I'd actually ask them critical questions, like help them devise critical questions that they answer themselves. Um, like if they've got a problem with the book, if they've got a problem, oh miss, I don't like this picture, then you, you have to get them to sort of write about it or talk about it. So they, they tell you why, okay? So for example, I gave this picture and one student said to me, oh, miss, why is it always like a white example? And I said, um, you know, I, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know, what, why, why should it be another example? Oh, because such and such reason. And then you have this conversation and there might be a white student who might say, what you're trying to say that there shouldn't be any white students in that book. And then you'll have the other, uh, the, maybe the uh, person from maybe Pakistan or India turn around and say, no, but come on, you've got to admit everything in this book positive is white and everything is negative. And you, you're not necessarily, it's not necessarily a part of your, your lesson, but it's a very geographical conversation going on here and it's very high level. Does that make sense? So sometimes as a geography teacher, you've got to, you got to allow the students to have this dialogue and this discussion amongst themselves. You'll be surprised at their knowledge. I get surprised. I'm like, whoa, this, this guy just gets it. <laughs> Does that make sense? And he's going to explain it better than me. Yeah. And then all of a sudden he's explaining to the, the other student, indigenous maybe to the UK, um, that, look, this is, this is how I feel. I mean, that's representing you. That's not representing me my connection to the globe would look very different to yours. And then he'd turn around and go, how? And he'd be like, well, and then I'll go, okay, guys, let's, let's do this properly. Right? Let's, let's do our little mind map. And then let's talk about it. And then they're writing pages and pages of geography. And they're going into atlases going, wait. And they're getting their atlases out and they're trying to look for the spelling of the country that they want to talk about. And, and there was one example, it's really interesting. Um, one one boy said to a Somali boy, um, oh, your country is just an LID, uh, LEDC anyway. And he goes, uh, oh yeah, and, and what's your country? And he goes, yeah, we're, we're, we're like developed. And then another boy turned around, he wanted to also say to the Somali boy that you got, you're from an LEDC and he couldn't say it. He goes, you're from a, you're from a less economic, <laughs> and he was like, literally reading um, what I wanted them to learn because this was like a, like several, several years back but it was just hilarious how they were trying to read the key words to actually have this battle with each other this intellectual battle with each other and then they were dipping into the atlases having this conversation but it was healthy because I was monitoring it I didn't let it go out of hand because as a teacher you have to facilitate and contextualize what they're saying as well and bring it back and make make the environment safe and, 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 and as a teacher, you should know at the end of it that no one's feeling upset. And you look at everyone's faces to make sure no one's upset. Now, I want to ask you a question, if you are a teacher, that when you do teach about countries within Africa, Asia, or the global South, and you do have a student from an ethnic minority background, do you do that? Do you actually look into their eyes and see what it's doing to your child in your class? Or do you just think, I've got to get through the content because you can go through the content. I know it's hard. You've got exams, you've got uh, specs, you've got lots of things to consider when you're teaching. There's things you don't agree with, but you still gotta, you still gotta work it out. But you can have a little 10 minutes 
to critically evaluate the whole system with its students. And trust me, they're, they're smart. They know what you're talking about and they, they accept it and they change it. And they know that, Miss, all right, so this is for the exam, but in real life, this, good. Does that make sense? No, it, it does, Irem. And, and I guess the example you just given, uh, clarify the points I made about how the, the personal, the interpersonal, you know, the institution, the structure all collide in the space of a classroom um, through interactions that we have. So no, that the example really, really did, did help and make sense, Irem. Thank you. That's awesome. Thanks so much. And just to kind of say thanks again to um, the three of you, that's been just absolutely um, stunning and just so, so many brilliant ways in which um, kind of we might take uh, this conversation, these actions forwards. Um, there were a few comments um, and I was conscious that um, there was a hand that um, I kind of missed as well. Um, in our last bit of time together, if people have got any questions, um, if you either want to use the chat or to raise your hand and then we'll kind of take a few together and, and put them um, to James, Angela and Iran. But um, can I just check, uh, Julie, your hand was up. Would you like to come in at this point? Yes, thank you. Um, I am Black African and I teach English currently. What I've noticed is for anyone to be able to teach, you've got to have a certain type of relationship with the children. And I've noticed that if I don't explain myself, and get what I call the elephant in the room out of the picture, it's always there making a noise in the corner. So what I've noticed is I meet a new group of students and we introduce each other and they ask me questions. I even give them room to put questions in a hat so that they don't feel they're being personal because I think we've got to a point where some people are so scared to ask anything on race because they've been frightened into not asking. And yet they're children who are curious. So I open myself up and deal with the questions. And once we are through that chapter, then I can go on to cover whatever it is that I need covered because they trust and they know where I'm coming from. Sometimes they'll even ask what my qualifications are because in their mind, there is now cognitive dissonance. Here's a black woman who's dressed like a black woman who's coming to teach me English. How does that work? So that's what I wanted to contribute. That it's really important to establish that relationship mm -hmm. and to get all the questions out of the way. Brilliant, thanks so much. And I'll just kind of quickly jump in to put Matt's question to the panel as well and then um, if there are responses either to the point or to Matt and um, then we'll have those across. So Matt's question is how can we be sensitive to the risk of racialized trauma in teaching about colonization and its contemporary legacies i.e how can we de decolonize teaching about colonization? That question plus Julie's points their reflections from any of you. Really good. So I just want to firstly acknowledge Julie's point, which I think is a, is a fantastic one and speaks very much to our, our principle about saying the unsayable and having those uncomfortable conversations. And what I'd also say is that introductions are important in sometimes in very, very simple, subtle ways in that, do you know, it's like to have someone mispronounce your name consistently. One of the, it sounds really silly, but one of the easiest ways to make someone feel less significant or take their dignity is just to say their name wrong all the time. So what I tend to do when I'm teaching, especially small group teaching, I ask everybody to introduce themselves as a way for me just to even just learn how to say someone's name. So I think Julie's right that it does help also to get those elephants in the room out of the way. Um, in terms of Matt's question, how can, we be, how can we be sensitive? I'll answer that question, but then I'll also start with a different perspective is that also we have to also think about the racial trauma that happens when we don't talk about colonialism and we don't. So, so I think it actually works both ways as well, Matt. But in terms of this, this, um, this question, it's a very, very tricky one. And I think, think also depends on the age that you're working with to find that, that the balance. Um, my approach has often been that, so say for example, I'm, I, I teach development geography at Loughborough and we look at um, colonialism, of course, and we look at King Leopold in the Congo. Yeah, so for example, 
that is a very emotive and very actually, it could be a very triggering discussion to have. You know, if for those of you aren't aware, King Leopold did some quite hor horrific things or things were done in his name, I guess you could also say um, in, in the Congo. So do I show them images of these, these atrocities? No. <laughs> um, do, do I talk about them in great detail? No. But what I, I will say to students is that, for example, um, one of the ways that um, people were, were forced to do work were to have threats or actually have some of their um, bodily parts or limbs um, potentially removed. And I, I know that sounds quite gross and grotesque, but I, I might, I'm trying to just get around and say that I try and say it in the most sensitive way that I possibly can without dodging the, the subject at hand. Um, and I guess, I'm not sure, I'm not, Angela, I don't know if you want to come in here. I guess I'm trying to just think through a really kind of concrete example. And I'm struggling to come to one at mind at the moment, but my, my, my sense is that kind of, as Iram says, is that to some extent you have to read the room and almost have to respond to what you're seeing happening around you in, in the room because what might be triggering to one person doesn't trigger somebody else. So I don't think there's a catch-all approach to this. I think it's very much about being able to, to read the room and kind of gauge how the people in the room are, are feeling. Um, I, know, I know that's not a perfect answer, Matt, but I, I don't think there is a kind of a one-size-fits-all approach to, to how you would kind of get around this. Because it is a very, it's a very difficult conversation to have. Sorry, Iram, I think you wanted to step yeah, in. James, I'll jump in there. Um, my, my advice is just don't be afraid, you know? Don't be afraid of what you're gonna hear don't be afraid of what, what's going to unfold in your class. You, you know you care about your students, right? You know you care about what they're learning. So there's nothing to be afraid of. And this is a harsh reality. Colonialism is, you know, it's hard for me to sit with my dad when he tells me about the partition of Pakistan and India. It hurts because he's half Pakistani and half Indian. So he, he, he loves both countries, right? And when he talks about... Um, colonization and how Pakistan and India were split. It wasn't pretty, right? Literally, there were people from India, you know, with their, you know, they left their homes and there were people in Pakistan who left their homes and they literally went over the border, right? And they went past each other and it was horrible what happened. And yes, you're right, I wouldn't show pictures. However, I would let them know that it was quite a horrible thing that happened. And then there's the issue of Kashmir right? And people would call that a fuzzy boundary or they'd call that a disputed territory. Some kids even look at that atlas and they look for their place of um, birth and they can't find it. They're like, it's not even there. Like Palestine as well. Um, children from Palestine or Palestine, they look for their, their, their map. They can't find it in the textbooks. They can't find it in the atlas. And, and you know, these are, these are sad, you know, these are sad conversations that you have because then you've got this prevent um, looming over you. You've got, you know, your senior management saying, be careful what you teach. This is what I want to teach. Let's not go off the rails here. There's so many dynamics to think about, but you as a geography teacher are gonna make that decision. Uh, you're, gonna, you're gonna have to do justice to the students that you're teaching. And so I'm gonna go back to, don't be afraid and read around the subject. If there's a country that you're gonna teach and you know it has a colonial past, read about that colonial past. Um, you know, reach out to academics, reach out to scholars, find out before you even go into your class so that you feel confident. And it's all about confidence. And, and really as geography teachers, we should be the best. We should be the best at this. So Angela and Jim, both your hands up. Um, one minute each responses, final thoughts. Um, I was just gonna say that, and it depends again, as Iram said and, and James said, depends on who's in the room. And what the who's the majority and often you have to you want to do different things in the classroom you want to reach the people um who might be quite racist and their thoughts quite conservative and you want to also protect the students um from content from them from yourself even i think as a especially as a white geography lecturer you have, I have to i feel like I can do some of that protection. There can be a buffer, um, and that's not necessarily mutually exclusive. That you can, you know, reach opposite poles in the classroom. I think you can function as that. And yeah, it's it's, it's reading the room, but also experimenting. Like sometimes it may go slightly wrong, but then you have to also talk to the students afterwards or, or rectify something, and even or whatever. There, 
there are things that, that will probably go wrong, especially I'm not the most, so, <laughs> I prefer writing to speaking very much. So, but it's, yeah, it's an experiment that um, is I need to do. And I, I guess my, I'll be very quick, Steve. My, having thought through Matt's question a little bit more, I think what I'd really actually flag here is around, it also depends why you're doing what you're doing, what the context is. I think that's actually really important. Um, so I think when I'm talking about colonialism, um, that there's a context for why I'm having that conversation. And I think often when we do things that are a bit insensitive is when we're not thinking through the context of why we're doing what we're doing. Um, so again, so when I'm talking about King Leopold and the Congo, I don't just randomly just start to talk about colonial atrocities in, in Africa. You know, there's a, there's a wider context behind why I'm having that conversation. And I think that that context helps, I think, to sensitize what it is that you're saying. Um, I don't know if that's helpful, Matt, but I, I think really the key for me is actually the context within which that conversation is happening and why you're doing it. I think there's ways that you could talk about, for example, King Leopold in the Congo, that could be very, very triggering and traumatic for someone. There's ways that I think you can do it that could be far more sensitive and far more caring and, and, and thought through. Um, I know that's not a perfect answer to your question, Matt. It's a really, really good question, actually. I think we do need to think more about, as I said before, um, kind of safeguarding issues in, in both higher education and also school teaching. And because some of the stuff we do teach is quite traumatic, but I am a big believer that actually some of the stuff we're doing now is actually very traumatizing to, to children um, and, and adults as well, um, both across the board. And, you know, so, so I think there's, there's lots of work to be done on that point, Matt, around kind of traumatization and, and harm that we're doing to students. But sorry, Mike, not a perfect answer, but it's the best I could do in that time. No, that's brilliant. And I don't know if you've seen in the chat and Matt's kind of, uh, uh, kind of response in there as well. And the uh, the kind of link from Andrew as well, um, if people will notice, then there's a link for their race working group that's got some um, kind of resources um, with and for school teachers as well. Um, I'm really sorry that we're kind of out of time. Um, I could sit and listen to the three of you and I'm more for um, kind of an awful lot longer. And um, there's just so much just absolutely brilliant um, thing and provocations. And um, kind of that, I'm going to stick with me this asking myself in the textbook, do they know it's Christmas um, as, a, as a test? But um, no, thanks so much um, kind of for being part of this um, conversation. And thanks everyone for um, joining us.